sisters in Christ. The first reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them the recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Word of God, word of life. The psalm today is Psalm 126, and we will read it responsibly. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheep. The second reading is from the book of First Thessalonians. Chapter 5. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For all is this the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of the prophets. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? 
He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Word of God, word of life. Grace to you and peace from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A few years ago, in the community where we used to live, I was a part of a team of teachers for what was a community leadership training program for young professionals in our community. My job was to speak about values-based decision-making. When I was asked to do that, I had never studied values-based decision-making. She just figured I might be able to figure it out before the class. Two lessons from that time really stuck with me. Two stories um, of the narratives of companies and values-based decision-making has stuck with me. Um, the first is around the company Toyota. Toyota, a company 40 years ago, was making these dinky little frustrating cars that got good mileage in the middle of a gas crisis, right? What we remember about Toyota that has now suddenly become a powerhouse in the industry. That is attributed in large part, they say, to a value system that begins at the very top of the company and works its way down to the most lowly person working on the assembly line because every single person from the bottom to the top has the permission to hit the button on the wall that says stop the line, something's wrong. Every single person had the opportunity to take part in and pride in every piece of product that came off the line. And knowing that, it made them perform at a level that lived up to what the company said it was supposed to be about. The second company, I was reading through their, uh, their annual report the other day to remind myself of this. And in the year 2000, they expressed their corporate values as communication, respect, integrity, and excellence. Those were the co four core values of this company. This company in the 90s was fast moving. They were changed in the, interest, uh, the industry. They were a powerful stock on the rise. And these values were boldly printed in their 2000 annual report. And by the end of 2001, they didn't exist as a company anymore. Enron. Communication, respect, integrity, excellent. Fraud, right across the board. Who we say we are, and whether we follow through on who we say we are or not, matters. Now I mention these because both of them made very clear statements about who they are, who they were. The one that lived up to those values and those statements not only survived but thrived and the one that didn't, didn't. The texts we read today get at who we are and what we say we are and what we believe. They walk us again. If you heard the text this week, you thought to yourself, it sounds a lot like the text we read last week for the gospel. This is John's version of the Mark text we read last week. So it ought to sound very familiar, but it reveals to us a little bit more about John. Here, we don't call him the Baptist, just John. 
John is asked, who are you? Who are you? And he makes no bones about it. But he doesn't begin with, I am. He begins with, I am not. I am not the Messiah. I am not Elijah returned. I am not the prophet. I am simply one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I am a witness. The Gospel of John begins with the story of a man sent from God who knew he was not the light, but who came as a witness to testify to the light. The word witness and testify are the word that we now use mostly as martyr, as one who sacrifices themselves for the witness and the testimony that they will give. Our calling as people of faith mirrors John's call in many ways. We have to, in the same way, be clear about who we are, be clear about who we aren't, and what that means for us as we go out into the world. We begin with, like John, I am not. (laughs) Has anybody ever asked you about who you are as a person of faith? Anybody says, what kind of a Christian are you? And maybe you start with, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian. Or you get to, I'm a Lutheran, but I'm not that Lutheran. You've got to be careful about the way you emphasize that. I'm not that Lutheran, or I'm not that Lutheran. It matters how you say it. Those are only kind of helpful statements, right? They only say more about what we aren't. We know we're not this, we know we're not that, and it only helps if the person you're talking to understands what you mean. I was at the Toyota dealer just a few weeks ago, and I walked in, I was talking to the guy, and he asked what I did, and as often happens, I say I'm a pastor, and he says, oh, my girlfriend's family are Catholic. Is that at all similar? (laughs) Right? Guess what? All of that language about this, that, and the other thing doesn't help him at all. i got to figure out how to talk to him about who we are. But maybe the most important thing is to remember that we are not God. One of my favorite sayings we taught at confirmation at one point or other was, God is God and I am not. Because I think sometimes we get that confused. We have to remember that we are not the judge. We are not the arbiter. We are not the one that creates faith. And we are not the one that saves. We are like John, right? Simply witnesses to the fact that we have been part of creation. That we have been saved. And that one day we shall stand before the judge. One day we shall stand before the God who loves us. And you may think that's obvious. But it's important to remember who we are. When I listen to a lot of modern Christianity, modern pop American Christianity, I hear a whole lot of language that begins to sound like I am the God of my own existence. I can figure it out on my own. I've got this. I am not God. So who are you? Who do you say you are? It's worth noting that throughout the Gospel of John, here at the beginning, John says, I am not, I am not, I am not. And through the entire rest of the Gospel, Jesus will be saying, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the water. I am the good shepherd. I am the I am. We, like John are simply voices in the wilderness, making it possible, hopefully, for others to see God. If you read the text nice and close, it says, John tells them, there is one who stands among you. John is telling them that he is already here. The one you seek is here already. 
And I am here to, to show you that He is here. I am here, you, here to show you that God is present and God is with us and God is faithful and He stands among you already. And that is our same call. God is here. God is present. God is with us. God is faithful. And we have the opportunity to live in such a way that makes that visible. So returning to the statements I made at the beginning, I asked, does your mission statement match the way you live your life? Does what you say you believe find energy, feet, hands, voice on Tuesday as strong as it does on Sunday morning? What does that mean for us if it does or it doesn't? What does it mean that we're supposed to live our life in conjunction with what we believe. I think both, first, both, both, wow, that's a hard word, both First Thessalonians and Isaiah help us out here. First Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks always, hold fast to what is good, abstain from what is evil. Pretty clear. Rejoice, pray, give thanks, do good, don't do evil. Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim. The Spirit of the Lord is with me so that I might tell those who are oppressed good news. So that I might say to those who are captive, you are free. So that I might release prisoners. So that those who mourn might find comfort. So that those have been unjustly oppressed might find justice. I am called to live in such a way that what I say becomes action. That what I profess becomes the way I live my life. We are called to pray and to work, or to pray and to action. Kyle Schiffelbing Guerrero, none of these theologians have easy names anymore, <laughs> writes about that balance, and he writes about how prayer ought to lead us to action. He says, prayer takes us out of the world to be in relationship with God, and work places us directly in the world to be in relationship with others. Where we encounter God, and so we pray, and it takes us out of the world to be in relationship with God, which drives us back into the world where we work in such a way that we are in relationship with others. And it becomes this circular, repeating cycle. I pray to work, to pray, to work, to pray. It's how my work and my prayer become indistinguishable. Prayer sends me into the world to work where I meet Jesus by my service, which calls me back to prayer, which sends me into the world to meet Jesus where I work. We are called to live simply like we know how the story ends. And we do. We read the beginning of the Gospel of John. We read that beginning of the good news that we read about last week in Mark. And we know how it ends. We know the path it takes. We know that this cross is a defeated symbol of death. That our God destroys that. And it allows us to live in freedom in this world trusting that God is present and God is active. Our expectation being formed by the salvation that has already been given to us. Changing us, transforming us, setting us free. It is how we will celebrate the incarnation where God takes flesh for you. It is how we give thanks for the resurrection where God gives life to you. And it is where we pray for sanctification, where God shapes our life between our prayer and our work, between our belief and the way we live out what we say we believe. How do we bear witness as we go out into the world? We simply work so that what we profess matches what we believe. We rejoice, we pray, we give thanks, and we carry a message of freedom and grace to any who find themselves in bondage, exile, or places of darkness. 
we, like John, have a message. The light is here, the gift is yours, and the promise is true. Hallelujah. Amen.